Hello everyone. Welcome to a new video from Random Times. Uh, today we are doing a podcast and the motive of Random Times is to educate people on new alternative investment platforms because there's not much information about these platforms in the market. And in this series, we'll try to interview the founders of these platforms and ask them questions about how, those plat how these platforms work and what kind of returns people can expect and what are the risks associated with these platforms. So in this video, I have Avinash with me. He's the founder of AllDRX. Um, he has a very strong experience in real estate. And that is one of the reasons I you know, explored this platform because for me, it is very important that the founding team has a very good understanding of the business they're doing. So Avinash, welcome to this podcast. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ron, thank you. Uh, before I ask any questions uh, you know, about the platform, I would like you to introduce yourself, introduce the platform and about your experience in real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, before I start doing my introduction, I would like to uh, uh, obviously thank you and also commend you on the kind of work you're doing. It is uh, extremely commendable. Uh, the initiative that you've taken with Random Dimes is fantastic. It gives a great perspective to uh, investors and it acts as a voice of uh, reason for uh, uh, for everyone concerned, right? The ecosystem that you're creating is fantastic. So kudos to you and uh, all the best uh, to you and hope uh, that you grow this platform by leaps and bounds. So uh, on, on that note, uh, a brief introduction, started off as a professional in the year 2000, worked in uh, the telecom sector for uh, almost uh, half of my professional career. That is a uh, career of about 23 years in which 50% uh, was spent in uh, telecom and 50% was spent in real estate. Uh, my longest stint in telecom, I mean, I had stints with Reliance, I had stint with Samsung, then I had a long stint with Tata Teleservices for about eight years. My last assignment with them was uh, as the geography head for the enterprise business. Uh, moved on to uh, uh, Knight Frank, where I was a regional head for uh, the southern region for a couple of years, and then spent a long time in uh, Purvankara. As you know, Purvankara is a listed entity, uh, heading their budget home segment that was the Provident Housing uh, uh, brand and uh, Purva Land. Spent eight years there. So overall, uh, out and out business operations, sales, marketing, these are things I know very well, have been a customer facing person for the longest period of time, started selling a long, long time ago and uh, have been at it. Uh, understand uh, both revenue side, cost side of uh, real estate, understand re residential real estate pretty well, having uh, you know managed uh, large scale projects uh, over the last few years and uh, and very happy to be here very happy to share my experience uh, share what we are doing with uh, all drx and how we believe this could be transformative in more ways than one so what exactly is all drx because uh, uh, i understand it's a fractional real estate platform but what what is the business model how does uh, all drx work and what does it provide to the investors at its uh, core it is a platform where People anywhere in the country can buy and sell one square foot of real estate. Fundamentally, that is what we are enabling. Uh, as you're aware, as you would have spent a lot of time in real estate yourself, you understand how real estate works. It's very clear that uh, real estate is easy, easier to buy, harder to sell, and uh, it is hyper-local. Meaning, regardless of how, how successful, say, Bangalore is as an economy, as a as a as a real estate uh, market too, or how successful say Pune is as a real estate market too, or any other market in this country. What happens is that people are uh, so connected with their city that if, regardless of where they're working or what they're doing, they would ultimately come and invest in real estate in their city. So this is how people have been doing so for a very long time. And when you look at say residential real estate, people look at that five kilometer radius from where they have grown up or if they continue to live in the same city to come and buy there. And even if people come in play, uh, cities like uh, Bangalore where people have come from all walks of life and from across the country, they still look at uh, locations which are say closer to work, but their ultimate investment will be from where they are, right? So we want to change this, you know, we want to change this in many ways. We want to allow people to invest in real estate the way they invest in the stock market. Doesn't matter for anybody as to where the headquarters of one particular company is, right? They come and buy shares of that company based on the performance of that company. So similarly, real estate as an asset class is like a company itself. It will perform for you over a period of long uh, over a long period of time. 
the life of any real estate is 60 70 years we know that uh, uh, by now and uh, in our country land is extremely valuable so as land prices keep going up and as uh, the population keeps growing up i mean it's not something that we are very proud of but bangalore is uh, one of the most populous uh, cities in the country that leads uh, it to become congested and that also means there is greater economic activity. Now, how can people across India participate in this economic activity is what all DRX will enable. So, uh, I think uh, tokenization is one of the principles or one of the ways through which you are providing uh, this asset class uh, to people or you're democratizing this asset class. So, a lot of people think that you know, tokenization is something like crypto, but what, how does tokenization work? And, you know, I think it's, it's totally different from what people have uh, assumptions about crypto. So, upfront, we are not a crypto exchange. We don't have anything. We are even, I mean, we are as far away as, as crypto as uh, a, any other asset class can be at this point in time. We do use blockchain primarily to build an architecture which people can trust in. And that is the reason why we uh, write our tokens on blockchain. That is just purely to make sure that people know that uh, these are uh, trustworthy uh, architectures and they will uh, last the test of time. So these are asset-backed tokens. So fundamentally what happens is, uh, because you mentioned crypto, I'm saying crypto is quasi-currency. We are not quasi-currency at all. So we are fundamentally asset-backed tokens, meaning uh, if you have to invest on our platform, you have to complete your full KYC, meaning you come onto our platform, you complete your uh, uh, KYC, all done digitally. Your Aadhaar gets verified, your plan gets uh, uh, verified, you create a wallet, you create your bank account, and then you start investing. So the ultimate beneficiary is always known. And uh, all the tokens that we mint, all the tokenization that we do, will be on, you will only be able to use those tokens on our platform to buy and sell those tokens. These are not tokens which can be used on any other chain. These are not tokens that you can use and uh, you know buy anything else. It's purely uh, meant for real estate. It is meant for trading in real estate and uh, uh, nothing else. So at this point in time, it's very clear. What we are doing is pretty much clear on our platform. It can be easily read, easily understood. So somebody comes onto the platform, is able to buy one square foot, one token, which is is equal to one square foot at say 10,000 rupees. Tomorrow on our trading platform, this one token can be traded. There is an offer for sale that can be made and then somebody can buy it. And tomorrow that buyer can become a seller. So ultimately, all that happens, happens in an environment which is closed. It's not an open environment, uh, unlike uh, the crypto environment, which is pretty open. It's a closed environment. This is a complete trustworthy environment where the architecture is such where everyone knows what they are dealing with and how the pricing is moving. So, for example, it is hard to assess what the pricing is going to be. So, we have created multiple mechanisms to ensure that the pricing is uh, fully transparent. We will uh, we will put up a pricing algorithm on our platform where people will be able to actually see through the algorithm inside out, and they will know exactly how we are pricing the token. So, all these all these are things that we are doing to ensure that uh, there is greater credibility on the platform as well as ensuring that uh, we are within within uh, whatever laws that we have to be all right interesting so i think uh, through tokenization through technology you are making it easy for investors to buy and uh, uh, sell these uh, assets so i think the other part of uh, the ecosystem is the kind of assets uh, you are uh, buying and so and for for you know an investor it's generally tough to buy a good real estate because they are not uh, really uh, they do not understand the geography. They do not understand the micro markets. So what is your process? How do you do the due diligence for those, these assets? I will take you through uh, the nature of assets. Fundamentally, we are focused whenever we say tokenization or whenever we say fractional, there's a general tendency to believe that it is going to be rent yielding office assets, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, that's not the case with us. We are focused on the residential side of the business. We believe uh, the residential asset class is the biggest asset class in the country. And it has the greatest potential in terms of uh, capital appreciation, in terms of growth, uh, when compared to any other uh, real estate asset class. Uh, Four lakh square foot of uh, residential uh, assets get sold in the primary market. Four lakh square foot in a year. Uh, uh, that one can argue saying that, okay, it's an aberration, one good year. But over the last six years, if you look at it, close to anywhere between two and a half lakh to 
4 lakhs being the peak that is the kind of uh, uh, sale of uh, uh, completed apartments that has taken place in the in six seven cities in our country in the primary markets i'm not even talking about the secondary market the secondary market is a different story altogether so we want to focus on uh, res residential as an asset class we want to focus on prime land that is developed land we want to focus on rental housing co living uh, student housing senior living uh, holiday homes so these are the categories that we want to focus on it's not to say that we don't look at other asset classes but this will be our primary uh, focus so the process that we use is a is a very technical and scientific process we identify a good property by a good property i mean is we go ahead and identify a property which is a, a grade a property meaning the developer is well known has a good brand and most critically we do not invest in under construction assets we only invest in ready assets so we identify the property through our due diligence process seeing which micro market is growing what is the potential of that micro market what is what is it today and what is it 10 years down the line you know real estate is uh, i mean there is a saying in real estate that you make money when you buy so we want to keep uh, keep that uh, underlying understanding very clear we want to buy good assets which give great value for money so we identify this asset then uh, we have a we have an accredited valuer who values the asset uh, this accredited valuer is uh, fully authorized valuer who values the asset and we assess whether the buying price is the right price at which we are buying that is one secondly we have identified uh, uh, we have partnered with uh, a very good ipc that is knight frank which does a complete uh, micro market due diligence meaning uh, what is the potential of this micro market and what is the uh, current potential of the micro market and what is it going to be 10 years down the line and what is it that we are doing uh, with this asset so all these aspects are captured in a report which is transparently shared on our uh, platform then we conduct a thorough legal due diligence we have uh, some very good lawyers through whom we conduct a thorough legal due diligence and this legal due diligence uh, captures all the technical aspects of the building captures uh, all the legal aspects of the building to ensure that uh, legally everything is clear so we do all this and then all these reports are published on our platform when these reports are published on our platform uh anybody can read it anybody can see and then we uh, we have a have an information memorandum this information memorandum will capture more details so the whole idea is that when we go and identify an asset we ensure that that asset uh is i mean all that needs to be uh, spoken about the asset is clearly put out there so that there is no ambiguity Uh, a micro micro market analysis takes into account not just uh, how the prices are moving takes into account what is the social infrastructure today what is the kind of social infrastructure there will be and what is the kind of physical infrastructure today and what is the physical infrastructure going to be tomorrow so basically uh, you know uh, let's take bangalore for example as we are currently uh, listing properties in bangalore only uh, opportunities in bangalore only uh, how the metro is uh, metro movement is going to happen say in 2025 to 2035 how the metro movement is going to be what is the coverage it's going to take and uh, where all it will reach so these are things that uh, we do in greater uh, detail and uh, every all this is uh, there for everyone to see uh, i can take a few more minutes to explain the process of how opportunities are listed and how these opportunities move so with your permission i can just uh, sure sure please uh, so fundamentally what we do is uh, we identify special purpose vehicles each each opportunity is a special purpose vehicle for example bangalore prime land investment opportunity is a is a special purpose vehicle which is created we have just closed uh, one one uh, plan recently now we are we have identified another property and we are adding that property so what we do is we once we uh, launch an opportunity we curate close to 15 to 20 properties within that uh, within that uh, spv itself within that special purpose vehicle itself so when uh, somebody is buying uh, say one square foot that person is investing in one square foot not just in one property basically is investing in that entire opportunity so over a period of next 2 years we'll keep adding properties into this spv and by way of which we will arrive at a net asset value so somebody who's invested who's the first investor gets the advantage of all the 20 properties that we are going to invest in so upfront we will let our investors know which are the properties that we are investing in 
where what is the buying price that is going to be, which micro markets, the names of these properties, how we are going to ensure that uh, the price of the property does not exceed a certain threshold, how we are going to ensure that uh, the developer is of a particular category, how we are going to ensure that it's always going to be a, a ready property, and how we will endeavor to purchase a property at a price which is lower than the prevailing market price. That's an endeavor. You know, you all of us should understand that endeavor. Uh, there can be a gap between that endeavor because markets move, and if markets are uh, bullish, then it's all it's good for all of us, and the growth is going to be higher. So each opportunity, each investment opportunity, curates the properties. We do that for the next uh, uh, two years. People, I mean, we keep acquiring it, and then we uh, let that property. Uh, uh, let that opportunity develop for the next few years, and at some point in time, those opportunity—I mean, benefits of those opportunities—will come back to the token holders when we start liquidating those positions in each of those uh, in each of those SPEs. So, anybody who comes in with ten thousand rupees today will get the benefit of not one investment, but all the twenty investments, say, to the tune of twenty crores. It starts with a one crore investment, moves on to twenty crores in two years. And people will get the benefit of across. Uh, will get the benefit across all those uh, investments. So this is the this in a nutshell. This is how we are going to uh, go about uh, uh, curating properties into uh, investment opportunities. And that was like very detailed, and I think that would have helped, that would help investors to understand the whole process. I think one um, challenge a lot of people face with alternative uh, investments is that, you know, unlike mutual funds, which have a detailed framework and guidelines by regulatory authority, uh, there are not many uh, frameworks for alternatives. So for uh, fractional real estate, is there any regulatory framework? Is there any body which uh, dictates, you know, how it should be done, what should not be done? So uh, fundamentally, uh... Uh, we have we have created uh, we have created certain do's and don'ts for ourselves, and uh, uh, we have we have got uh, the best lawyers and the best uh, tax consultants advising us. It's available on our platform. Who are the lawyers and who are the tax consultants uh, advising us? And uh, we follow the company laws perfectly. And uh, those company laws are uh, uh, we ensure that all the company laws are adhered to the way they have to be adhered to. Because when we are creating an SPV, which is in the form of an LLP. All those company laws are being adhered to. So that is one aspect of it. The second aspect, as you would have known, uh, uh, I think a month back, uh, the Honorable Chairperson of SEBI has clearly issued a notification where uh, they have said that uh, MSM REIT is a reality. And uh, in the next few, maybe few weeks, hopefully, we will see uh, the regulations around MSM REIT come out. And when these uh, regulations are out, I think uh, we will have far greater clarity in terms of uh, what how SEBI is looking at it. So that is one. Second, she also did mention in her uh, press conference that uh, they are largely, SEBI is largely okay with the way uh, fractional of, of fractional uh, service providers are operating. And they've said that fractional service providers have the option of either coming into the MSM REIT or operating outside the MSM REIT as they deem fit, uh, given the uh, structure that it will take. So I think uh, that's a very positive step in the yeah, and a step in the right direction because rightfully said that uh, whenever there is a regulation, people uh, feel a little bit more confident, bit more, uh, bit more, uh, you know, comfortable making their investments. Having said that, uh, uh, serious platforms like us uh, have taken have taken a lot of uh, effort in the last uh, one and a half years to ensure that we cover all the legal aspects of doing something of this nature. We understand that it's very important, so we've covered it. We, we, we are very happy to share that with uh, uh, any of our investors, both prospective and uh, existing investors, and uh, explain to them how we have gone about uh, doing what we are doing. In addition to that, uh, we are one of the first asset-backed tokenization platforms to be admitted in the sandbox in Gift City in Gandhinagar. So as we know, Gift City is, an offshore, is a creation of an offshore entity where international uh, uh, properties can be brought in where... Uh, investments can come in both from uh, uh, both from foreigners as well as uh, Indians into international properties and uh, vice versa in Indian properties from uh, foreigners because we will be a listed entity in GIFT. So we are working with them in setting up regulations as well as uh, getting our, uh, uh, I mean, getting the process of sandbox uh, 
uh, completed over the next uh, six to nine months. So there are there are uh, very good tailwinds on this front where uh, regulations are taking shape, and these regulations will go a long way in uh, helping uh, shape an industry which is budding. Because see, uh, as you're aware, India is a country of uh, small uh, investors as well as small asset owners. The exits that can be given to small asset owners over a period of time is what we need to see and how those exits can be curated in a manner which is uh, obviously uh, legal, number one. And also most importantly, uh, those assets can keep giving returns to investors for a long period of time. So these are things that we are uh, working on doing and uh, uh, all the steps that are being, uh, all the steps that we can see being taken are in the right direction. What kind of properties can investors expect uh, from RDRX? Whether different uh, be yield based properties or be capital appreciation focus? So our focus will always remain on uh, uh, capital appreciation. We believe capital appreciation is the reason why people get into real estate investments, and uh, I don't see any reason why uh, we should move away from that thesis. Uh, there will be rentals that these properties will earn, but these are residential properties and uh, the rentals and residential properties vary anywhere between 3% to 4% or 5% yielding properties, right? That is the kind of yields that people get in residential real estate. It is moving up. It is moving up, certainly. Uh, but uh, it is not the same as, say, an office asset will get. Right. But the thing with residential is uh, that it is not uh, dependent or its uh, capital appreciation is not held hostage to the rental returns that it earns right mm -hmm. it is it is a, it is a function of how the market mar micro market grows and it's a function of if you are seeing 7 8% inflation the likelihood of uh, your property appreciating on an annual basis at 4 5% is a given mm -hmm. right that's how that's how things have moved over a period of time and if it is uh, if it is uh, developed land like the cases in the many uh, Many southern states, right? Many southern states of our country, we have developed land as an option where people buy and build their own homes. Uh, unlike in other parts of the country where it may not be as uh, as uh, you know prominent as it is in the southern states, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, even uh, uh, Kerala to an extent. So over there, uh, land generally appreciates faster and uh, at higher rates. That's what uh, that's what been seen. Uh, what's been seen over the last few decades and i don't see any reason why that will change um, bangalore is a as a city has a population of uh, has a population density of uh, 15 16000 uh, people living per square kilometer right so obviously land is exceedingly valuable uh, when you look at uh, various other parts of the cities they are also in and around those ranges so uh, land is extremely valuable uh, apartment complexes are giving a great lifestyle they become very uh, valuable and uh, so we, we are very gungo about the fact that uh, capital appreciation will continue and it's a great uh, uh, great asset class to stay invested in. What it does fundamentally is it's not for somebody who is actually looking at just buying one home, right? If I'm a citizen in Bangalore, okay, I can buy an apartment in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. But I'm a citizen in Bangalore, I'm living in Bangalore and uh, uh, I'm residing in Bangalore and I want to invest in Pune. Now I want to invest in Injavadi. Injavadi has got three phases, right? Now, mm -hmm. In the three phases, where do I invest in? How do I invest in? Uh, why should I invest in Injavadi? Why should not I invest in uh, uh, Vaguli? Or why should I not invest in uh, Undri, for example? Now, this, if I'm a local local person, I'll understand it very easily. But because I'm not local, and now I have an opportunity to invest in Undri, Vaguli, and uh, and uh, Injavadi by putting say one lakh rupees, you know. 30, 33,000, 33,000, 33,000 in three of these micro markets. Now I have hedged my risk and I have participated in a in a city which is today selling more apartments than even Bangalore. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Pune, Pune sells more apartments uh, every year than Bangalore in the, for the last two years. It's selling more than 50,000 uh, apartments. Now, many people are not able to anticipate this or also see how they can invest it. So if you're, if you're on a platform like ours, and when we bring the Pune opportunity and we curate the Pune rental housing investment opportunity, you will have so many of these uh, assets that you can invest in. At the same time, you take a, you get the advantage of investing in all these growing micro markets, right? Uh, at one point in time, Hinjavadi was one phase. Then it came to phase two. Now it is phase three. 
I mean, it's still growing. It's such a it's such a robust uh, and fantastic micro market. Same is the case with East Pune. I mean, uh, if you go towards Undri, there's so much of growth that is taking place. But somebody sitting in Bangalore will not have a view on this. Will not have an understanding, and will only see reports every year and say, "Oh, I should have invested in uh, you know Pune." Is the same way somebody would say that. I mean, you're uh, you're in uh, Bombay. I'm not sure whether you've invested in Bangalore because you will think, I mean, Bombay is so big. I mean, MMR is such a fantastic region. I can keep investing in Bombay and uh, go and see my pro investment every uh, once in a while. So on our platform, this just gets democratized and people can invest just about anywhere and uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, they don't have to make large investments. They can take small bite sizes and uh, uh, invest in good good properties. I think a lot of people, uh, they uh, come to me and they say that uh, there are some other products, uh, some products like real estate, NCDs, which offer 15 to 18% yield. So or are they, uh, if we compare those products against uh, this asset class, so how do you uh, see the risk and return uh, profile? I think people should invest in what they think is the right way, uh, right instrument to invest. Right. Uh, let's look at our country. Uh, we have about eight and a half crore uh, DMAT accounts. Mm -hmm. But we must be having uh, at least uh, 50, 60 crore people investing in uh, FDs, right? Even today, the most people go and put money in an FD. Uh, the, the, the thinking... That we have, I think, uh, uh, largely is that uh, you should invest. Where you invest is a matter of your choice. Right. Uh, take an educated call to make investments. That is very important. Start saving, start making investments. They are good for you and they will help you uh, uh, generate alternate sources of income. Mm -hmm. That said, it is very important to uh, be able to figure out which investments, when, will give you better uh, uh, bang for your buck, right? So if you have 100 rupees to invest, put 10 rupees with us. And if you still believe that uh, NCDs are going to give you better returns, put 50 rupees with them. I'm saying, if you have decided that I'm, I have earmarked 100 rupees for investing in, uh, in uh, real estate, and this is the form of investment that I want. I want to invest 30 rupees in a real asset. I want to invest 20 rupees in stock. I want to invest 30 rupees in NCDs and I want to, I have left with 20 rupees. Where do I invest that? Mm -hmm. Come and invest that with us. It will still give you a greater return. But my only limited point is that when, when you put a money in an NCD, you still are betting on one uh, entity. You're betting on one company or you're betting on one. And uh, as, as you know that largely real estate organizations are concentrated in specific geographies. When you come and put money with us and you buy say one square foot, it's agnostic to a company. It is agnostic to one entity. It is agnostic to a location. It just becomes democratized to a large extent and you will benefit from any micro market growing over a period of time, right? If a micro market grows, your likelihood of benefit is high. If the city grows, the uh, benefit becomes greater. But tomorrow, even if there is limited growth, let's say a scenario, we're talking about growth scenarios, there will always be you know, scenarios where growth, uh, growth is not happening. But because growth is not happening, you still get optimized returns as you have uh, invested in, uh, you've not invested in one entity, right? So this is this is how we see it. So there is an opportunity for investors to make uh, good sustainable returns for a long period of time if they make investments through us. That said, investing is important and uh, one should uh, do their due diligence. And if they believe something is better, works better for them, uh, so be it. I mean, uh, who are we to tell them that uh, don't do this. I, I would rather tell them try us, uh, work with us, and see how we help you. Uh, uh, how we help you in your journey of investment, mm -hmm. and in the process grow it. Because I'm sure um, if you want, you can definitely structure in series also because with, with your background yeah. and uh, expertise, so that should not be a, a challenge. I mean, then, then you choosing this asset class, you know, giving priority over in series just because you see. Uh, the risk and return profile is more favorable compared to maybe a NCD on a real estate. Yeah, you're right. So our belief is that as long as you back it with an asset, right? So the asset has value. The asset's value will always remain. So whenever you're making an investment, uh, 
there is a lot of noise that you would be hearing around various other alternate asset classes, how people are making 15%, 20%. And then when things are not going great, they feel that they are losing out and the principal is at risk, right? So these are the kind of risks that people see. Now, when you are backing it with an asset, uh, the asset will always give you return, right? I mean, the asset tomorrow, if you have to liquidate the asset, you will still get your principal plus back. It may not be uh, the return that you may have anticipated, but the principal plus a certain amount of return will come back because the asset is backing it. So these are products that we will look at. Uh, uh, we are very very keen on seeing how we can uh, how we can create a systematic investment plan, right? A SIP for buying real estate. So I think that's a that's something that we are working on. So these are all these plans that we have, and over a period of time, we will curate some uh, exciting uh, uh, options in the alternate space for people to come and invest. So, uh, Avinash, uh, you you mentioned about uh, you know how the intention of the platform is to you know help people buy and sell uh, smaller, invest small amount of money in. Uh, land and or other asset, which generally has been a forte of larger investors. So I think one of the criteria yes. for that is uh, liquidity because um, because you have to sell those uh, assets at some point in the future. So what is the mechanism for liquidity uh, and how do you see people selling those assets maybe in the future or trading those assets in the uh, Future. Oh, perfect. Great. So uh, I'll just quickly uh, take you to the investment process on our platform so that uh, this will give a fair idea as to how this whole uh, liquidity aspect is being uh, addressed. So the uh, methodology that we follow is a very simple methodology where first we identify, identify an asset. The asset is uh, the first people who invest in the assets are like institutional investors or HNIs who bring in, uh, who come in as partners and invest at 10 and a half lakh rupees. The investment that comes in is about 10 and a half lakh rupees from uh, multiple uh, investors who are also partners in the uh, SPV and then they bring in this uh, investment. So say an asset is uh, uh, 1 crore 10 lakhs. So 10 people came and 10 people have put in that, uh, uh, that uh, amount of uh, money and now the that particular opportunity is then offered as the first square foot opportunity to the market, just like how in the case of an IPO, like an initial public offering, we don't use that phrase, but we say first square foot opportunity and that is offered to the market where people can come and now buy one square foot. This one square foot is priced at 10,000. So now these people have come and bought that uh, uh, one square foot. So they, they have given liquidity to the people uh, who invested the first time around, who invested a slightly larger uh, sum of money and then they have got their liquidity on the next step which is the, like the territory market which is like your trading exchange where we have uh, where we have peer people who can now in the in that market come and buy and sell one square foot so there is a demand and supply that has been created the people who want to sell can offer it to sell the people who want to buy can offer it to buy so hence there is liquidity at all stages of our uh, investment process. The last one being the trading exchange where people can come in, uh, buy and sell one square foot at a time. So this, uh, from an institution to moving it to uh, uh, retail, buy and sell is what we are enabling on our platform. This is where we are right now. Uh, all the all the stages of the investment are open. Uh, the trading exchange will uh, uh, be open very shortly in the next few days. It's just testing is going around. So we will have that also open. So. We have demonstrated how people can buy and sell at this point in time. Uh, a little bit more demonstration is required through the trading exchange. And that is uh, that is also uh, happening maybe in the next uh, fortnight. We should have that open for uh, everybody to come and trade. Uh, so do you also envisage uh, a situation in the future where, let's say, the assets have grown substantially or uh, they have appreciated in their value? And then you feel that maybe at this point, if we sell these assets, we can get a good uh, um, profit at this point and you can distribute it among the token holders. That is also uh, a part of the model or uh, you don't need Yes, to... that, certainly, that certainly is. Uh, that certainly is. You're absolutely right. There will be a point in time where uh, there will be significant appreciation in the assets and the people who are holding partnership rights, who are holding token rights at that point in time should benefit from that. So there will be a point in time where the asset can get liqu liquidated. Uh, Though, though that being said, we don't see it happening in the first 10 years. It may take about that kind of time frame for the assets to start getting liquidated because for it to run its full cycle and come its full circle and uh, realize its full potential, it should 
be held in at least for great for, for a period that is greater than seven eight years. So we only see that happening after ten years or so. So what are the uh, you know different products uh, in your pipeline in terms of uh, geographies, in terms of uh, uh, types of uh, real estate? So the geographies that we are focused on right now is uh, Bangalore, of course. The second, uh, third, fourth, fifth uh, geographies that may come will be Goa, Pune could be uh, a certain tier two cities that we are looking at, which could be very exciting opportunities that we may bring onto the uh, onto the platform. Uh, that is from a geography standpoint, uh, we are looking at NCR and Bombay as uh, Mumbai as uh, very key areas. Mumbai would be more of MMR region. So any anywhere in and around that region is what we are looking at. So these geographies are there on the, are likely to come onto the platform. Uh, holiday homes, uh, co-living opportunities, rental housing opportunities, uh, senior living opportunities, and uh, critically prime land opportunities, which is developed land. All these opportunities will continue coming. So we will keep focusing on these opportunities uh, with the focus being on prime land, uh, rental housing, co-living, senior living, student housing, and uh, even uh, uh, you know, I mean, holiday homes being a significant uh, chunk of the opportunities that will come up. Uh, I think one one last question uh, I have is, uh, I think that is a very critical question. Uh, so a lot of people say, you know, that uh, you know, real estate is, is a long-term game, like you also mentioned, and then say how safe it is, because there are two aspects to it. You know, one is the investments, and second is a lot of people say, you know, it's a startup, and what happens if two years down the line, they say that, you know, business model is not working, then how do we, ensure that our investment is protected what, what is there what kind of reports we have uh, because uh, yeah. i think people had you know, their share of experience yes, yes. valid apprehension from a standpoint of people questioning okay business model is fine today and tomorrow how it goes and what happens etc there are so many variables uh, at play and uh, very valid question so uh, one is obviously our credibility. That aside, you know, uh, what we are, what we are, what we have done is that uh, there is a special purpose vehicle created, and these assets are residing in that special purpose vehicle. So if if tomorrow something were to go wrong, God forbid, uh, the asset is still there, and uh, the asset can be liquidated, and people will get their uh, uh, money back in that in that scenario, right? So the asset is already there. The asset is not an under construction asset. It's a ready asset. It's in uh, if it is a if it is an apartment, it's a rent yielding asset. If it is a plot of land, it has uh, already appreciated in value. So over a period of time, the SPV holds the asset. It's not uh, necessary. So uh, the asset is not held by us as much as it's held in the uh, SPV. It's not held by all DRX. It's held in the SPV. So the SPV will be able to. Uh, able to liquidate that asset and uh, provide the kind of returns that get, that it gets at that point in time to the investors who are there in that uh, SPV at that point in time. So that way, I don't see there to be too much of a risk on that uh, on that front because it's all asset backed. So it's unlike in, uh, I mean, uh, as long as there's an asset, you, you all know there is value for the asset, there's value for the land, and that value will get translated into rupee value. It may take a little longer but it will get translated into rupee value tomorrow if and if something were to go wrong so we don't we don't foresee that as a as a real uh, real uh, uh, challenge at all actually because the uh, value of the asset is inherent right so it will always remain right that's how we see it and uh, i i mean yeah we are here for the long term play we we will we will continue to do things in a in a diligent manner uh, that's the reason why we are not looking at under construction as a as a as an opportunity under construction will offer us greater opportunity we can bring in many more assets but the reason why we are not looking at under construction is that to the small investor to the person putting 10000 rupees per square foot we don't want them to be exposed to something of this nature where there is construction risk great uh, thank you avinash uh, it was really great you know for you to answer these questions and I think this will be really valuable for people who are looking to invest or who are looking to explore uh, fractional real estate, uh, looking to explore how all DRX work. I personally have invested in one of the private opportunities because uh, I found it um, pretty good. I, I like the team. I like the, the idea. 
and I would be uh, sharing my uh, investment performance, you know, periodically, which will give more insights to investors. And I think people might have other questions also. They will have more queries when they want to invest, when they want to put in their money. I think probably I'll sure. share those questions to you probably and then uh, you can, if you can answer those questions also, maybe or a mail or maybe in the next uh, podcast we do, maybe after a couple of months. So that's what I have in mind. But it was a very great session. And thank you for your time, Avinash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your platform. I Like I said in the beginning of our conversation, what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. And uh, uh, working with you is a real pleasure. And uh, you hosting us and uh, over here is, a, again, a great uh, uh, pleasure of us. And uh, happy to answer any questions, any queries, uh, to do a second round of uh, a session just to answer these queries also is a uh, is a good enough thing. So happy to do all that. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, look forward to working together and creating some great uh, investment opportunities together. Thank you. Thanks, Avinash, and all the best for RDRX. Bye bye. Thank you.